It is my pleasure to introduce uh, Artan Sheshmani, who will talk about ITA class and sheaf counting on local Calabiao fourfolds. Artan, please. Thank you very much, Paul, and thanks for the organizers for uh, inviting me to this conference. I'm going to turn off my video because I'm going to share my whiteboard. Uh, so yeah, so the topic of the talk is going to be a TIA class and uh, sheaf counting, sheaf counting on Calabia fourfolds. Um, so I will tell you a little bit about what is a TIA class, even though many people among the participants already know these things, so I apologize in advance for saying repetitive things. And then I will relate it to enumerative geometry of counting sheets on Calabial fourfolds. And then maybe I can make some statement, statements about what are the consequences of these things? What can they tell about certain interesting problems in physics, for instance, also? All right, so let's talk about the TIA class a little bit. Uh, I just set the geometry for this. Let X be a given uh, a smooth, uh, projective variety. For now, I don't uh, mention anything about dimension of uh, X. And so let us assume that X is diagonally embedded in X times X. And there is an associated ideal to this thing, ideal of this diagonal embedding, I call it J. So if that is the case, then of course, there is a canonical short exact sequence, the structure sheaf of the ambient product so rejects onto structure sheep of X and ideal is J. Now, um, the structure sheaf of the diagonal in this ambient variety is clearly from this short exact sequence O of X cross X mod J. And you can have the structure sheaf uh, of uh, first, order, first order infinitesimal neighborhood so infinitesimal neighborhood of diagonal in X cross X. Okay, so this is funny. There are these dots that appear when I'm writing on my laptop anyway. Um, you can have structure shift of the first order infinitesimal neighborhood of Delta or diagonal. And that is basically O of X cross X modulo J square. And sometimes this is being called O of two Delta for instance. There is a short exact sequence that relates these two things to each other. And it's the clear one. This guy surjects onto O of delta. And you see if O of delta is, is basically this guy and the middle guy is O of X cross X modulo J squared. So clearly the kernel is going to be J mod J squared. And this is nothing but co-normal, co-normal sheaf of diagonal in X cross X. Okay, so why is this important? Because this thing is a short exact sequence in the category of modules over at O X cross X. So this is a short exact sequence in O X cross X modules and we can do things with it. So um, let us assume that I have X cross X with the two projections, natural projection maps onto X. And let us assume that I have a sheaf in here, an element of a billion co category of coherent sheaves on X. What I can do is um, I can take, pull back this sheaf up there and you know, tensor product it with the short exact sequence that I just described. So uh, if I call this short exact sequence something a star, then I can go pull back F. So P two upper star of F tensor with star. And I will get the following. So I will get P two upper star of F tensor structure sheaf of diagonal P two upper star of F tensor with O of two Delta and then P two upper star of F tensor with the co-normal sheaf and that's it. Then what I can do is I can push forward everything back down onto the other factor of X, but I will use the P1 projection map. So if I do that, 
because F is a coherent sheave supported on the diagonal. On, on this side, after pushing forward via the map P1 star, I will get F back. Here, I will get something in the middle. So P2 upper star of F, tensor O of two delta. And then here, clearly again, I will get F, but also I will get what is, of course, by definition, the cotangent sheaf of X. So that's it. So I will get this natural short exact sequence, which is now is a short exact sequence, realizes a short exact sequence is a category of OX modules, clearly. And all such short exact sequences are parameterized by a group. So all of them are all such short exact sequences are given by a group X1. F, F tensor cannot, you know, cotangent sheaf of X, okay? Or you can think of it as a vector space over complex numbers. And what is a tier class? So a tier class of F is an, in fact an element of this vector space. It's a point in this vector space, in this group. Is an element of this group and a point in this vector space over complex numbers. Now, I told you what it is, and now I can tell you what it means. Note that, note that P2 inverse, the morphism P2 inverse provides or induces a homomorphism, a, a homomorphism as follows. So P2 inverse, is providing a morphism from local sections of F to local sections of pullback of F. So um, local sections of pullback of F will be X times U intersected with the diagonal, pullback of F tensor with O of two dot. So what is U? U is an open patch inside X. So if I am picking some U inside here, I can look at local sections of U and P2 inverse basically uh, gives, produces a morphism on local sections or U sections of pullback of F over there. And then I can use projection formula. So by projection formula, we can actually see a fact, which is this is equal to local section isomorphic to, in fact, local sections over U again of push forward of the pullback of F tensor with the structure sheaf of infinitesimal neighborhood of delta. So what we are trying to say is, if you actually take this short exact sequence, which is a short exact sequence of OX modules and, you know, restrict to a patch U and then take global sections or local sections only over U, then you can see that P2 inverse in induces a morphism from sections in here to here. Okay, so what does that tell us? Then it tells us that if you have some OX linear, so if S, what I'm gonna call S, is an OX linear, OX linear splitting, then we can define an operator can define an operator. For instance, I'm gonna call this operator operator nabla, and it's going to be S minus P2 inverse, which I just defined, and it's going to induce a morphism from F to F tensor omega of X. And this is really because we just produced the map in the previous slide, we just produced the map from here to here, locally over U. So if you have an OX linear splitting, then then from here you can project onto here and that produces the map that you want. Oh, sorry, not here, but on this one. I'm working with this short exact sequence. Okay, so that's that. And so what does this tell us? So this provides, this delta, this provides uh, an algebraic connection, clearly as you can see from how it is written and defined, algebraic connection on this sheaf F. 
and hence atia class of f provides an obstruction an obstruction provides an obstruction to to existence of such connection existence of such connection um you can get such connection if the short exact sequence that i just produced uh splits and her hence this is actually telling you that a tier class which is the given by a non-trivial point in that vector space is going to be giving you the obstruction to existence of such algebraic connection okay so this is this is what a tier class is and we know what the formula for it is also and now we can generalize these things. So generalizations, generalizations of the Atiyah class, so generalizations. So for instance, one thing I can do is I can ask F to be not just a sheaf, but an object in the bounded drive category of S. Well, then again, it doesn't matter. So I can still define a tier class of F as a point inside this vector space. And here I am, you know, tensor producting in the sense of uh, left right, you know, tensor product with the cotangent shape of X. And it's going to be a point in here, basically. Not only that, of course, we know that as group, this is the same as homomorphisms over bounded drive category of X from F to F tensor omega of X shifted by one. So it's fine. So this group, we know how to produce either in drive category or over X and a TL class of an object in the drive category can be defined this way. Here again, the assumption is that X is a smooth. Okay, the other generalization that we can have, is what if X is singular? So if X is singular, we can still have that. We just need to, need to replace, need to replace cotangent sheaf of X with cotangent complex of X which I'm not going to go through because I mean, I'm sure everyone here knows what the potential complex is. However, for purposes today, so here is a remark for today, which is relating ATIA classes of objects in the drive category of a variety to a numeric geometry of that variety. I'm going not to use the full cotangent complex defined by Illusi, but I'm going to use just the truncation of it. So we are going to use, we are using truncation of cotangent complex at degrees bigger than minus one. So if I have X singular and someone asked me, what does the degree bigger than minus one mean? We can embed X into some smooth ambient variety and then cotangent complex of X basically can be um, given by quasi isomorphic to some complex, which is in the degree zero part, it's going to see sheaf of differentials of A restricted to X. This is degree zero part. In degree minus one part, okay, so let's say there is an ideal corresponding to this embedding, it's going to see the co normal sheaf of this embedding. And it keeps going like that. So, what we are going to use is here only these two terms. Uh, one other thing is that, for instance, if X is a singular stack, like a quotient to stack by some group, of course, your cotangent complex could have a term in degree one and so on, but we are not uh, interested in these things. At most, we are interested in singular Dilema for the stacks. And here actually with schemes really. Okay, so if I use truncated cotangent complex, then, uh, a tier class of F this way then is defined as, again, there is a tilde I put on it and uh, to distinguish between singular and a smooth, and it's going to be a point in the X1 F, F drive tensor product, the truncation. But sometimes I omit because from now on, let us just assume that I'm only interested in minus one truncation of the potential complex. And this is called the universal 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 truncated truncated atia class for 
some object f in the bounded drive category of x. And the definition and construction of this thing is really involved. I'm just, I'm not telling you how we have constructed it. I'm just telling you that now that we know what the Atiyah class of a sheaf is, there is a more general version of it, which is Atiyah class of the object in the bounded drive category for a singular variety. But mainly, this, this is main, uh, major work by Hoibrex and Thomas. So Hoibrex and Thomas constructed this object using some kind of Fourier, Fourier Mukai transform approach. OK, this is a 2010 paper. OK. And so for today, I'm going to talk about I'm going to use a, a particular version of this universal truncated ATIA class, which I'm going to call relative ATIA class, meaning that I'm going to work over a variety. And instead of the cotangent complex of that variety, I will write cotangent complex of that variety relative to another variety. So let us see what is that. So let us assume that we have, so here is a relative universal a tier class of F. So let us assume that we have two varieties X and Y with projections onto X and Y. And let us assume that over here, I have an object in the bounded drive category of X times Y. Okay. And so then uh, we can construct the tier class of F over X times Y. So a tier class of this F is going to be a point in the extension group of F and F tensor cotangent complex of X times Y. And of course we know that cotangent complex of X times Y is isomorphic to pull back of cotangent complex of X and pull back of the cotangent complex of Y. So we can in fact project onto cotangent complex of Y and then take the extension group. So we can, we can get an induced projection from here to extensions of F, F tensor cotangent complex of Y. And well, you know, obviously, because this is the same as cotangent complex of X times Y, then cotangent complex of Y alone is, can be realized as cotangent complex of X times Y relative to X. And so we can then look at the point in here and construct a tier class of F over there. And we can call this relative a tier class because really cotangent complex we are using or the truncation of is the relative cotangent complex of X times Y times X over X. And so why is this really useful? Example, um, let Y for us, and it is going to be that the, this 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 actually is going to be the example for us. Y is going to be uh, for us is going to be a moduli space of um, m x gamma, which is going to be by definition moduli space of sheaves in X with some fixed churn character. Chain character gamma. And so um, F that we are using in here, if this is a moduli space, so for us, if this is going to be our moduli space, this F is going to be the universal. We can make an assumption that our moduli space comes with a universal family. So this is an assumption. And so for us, this F is going to be the universal sheet. Okay, so, all right, so I've told you about universal truncated ATL classes and the relative versions as well. And now we know that this is useful for studying moduli theory, especially moduli of sheaves on a given variety X. Okay, is there any questions so far before I move on and basically tell you why this is interesting? Okay, so if not, now I need to tell you why is it that I'm defining this object? 
So, why? Interesting. So let me write down this group before looking at a point in this group. Let me just write down this group that so far we have constructed. It's an extension group. F is a universal sheath. And we are looking at an extension between F and be twisted by cotangent complex of a moduli space or its truncation. So we have a moduli space with projection maps and our sheaf, universal sheaf lives in here. And so this is the extension group is, whose point is non-trivial point is given us the ATL class. Now we can do some really kind of almost obvious manipulations and rewrite this group and see why is this actually helpful. So if I, this is actually something which is written on X cross M. So what I can do is I can write this thing as a homomorphism group in the boundary drive category of X cross M. This is the obvious thing. L dot of M shifted by one. Then I can just use a projection map. So actually this part, I don't need you to use projection. So this is naturally in the derived category. This is equal to homomorphisms. Uh, I can play a little bit with these things. So this is R hom F tilde F tilde. I can move this guy in here. I can do that. And this is a morphism also in the bounded drive category of X times the moduli space. And then I'm left here with the pullback of the cotangent complex of the moduli space together with the shift in the drive category. Anytime that I'm not putting a truncation, you should assume that there, this is all truncated. And then we can use Verdier duality, growth index Verdier duality. Okay. And so we will get a homomorphism in the bounded drive category of the moduli space. So I can project down on, along the fibers of P2. So this is what Verdier duality says. So I can project down to here. And then I will get higher direct image, P2 lower star of R hom F tilde F tilde. Again, I'm sorry that for many of the people in here, this is trivial, but anyways, I'm not sure. So, and then we can, we will be twisting, the Verdier duality has this twisting by the relative dualizing complex. So this is the relative dualizing complex and let us say that this D is a relative dimension. So relative, this is dimension, relative dimension of X cross M with respect to X. So, so IE, it is the dimension of X. And then I will get the cotangent complex of the moduli space together with the shift. Okay, so naturally, when you start from this group up here, naturally you end up with a group in the draft category down there. And so you can realize this as a morphism in the draft category, which is, I can rewrite it. R hom F tilde F tilde tensor with um, relative dualizing complex. I can put the sh all the shifts on one side, so D minus one, and that's it. And then I can then get a map to the co truncated cotangent complex of the modulus. Okay, so I think by now, uh, many people, even if they are not working over enumerative geometry, this object, this morphism in the drag category has become so famous. And this is the thing that is known as deformation obstruction theory. So let me call this thing E dot of X. So if you investigate fiber-wise over the moduli space, the cohomologies of this morphism that you obtained in the drive category, you can see that H0 of this morphism is going to be an isomorphism. And H minus one of this morphism is going to be an epimorphism. So H0 of this morphism maps the H0 of the A dot of X, the sheet cohomology, to H0 over here, and so that's basically a mapping of deformations. And if it is isomorphism, it's basically telling you that this object in the draft category has a zero cohomology, which is capturing deformations of points that the moduli space parameterizes. 
And H minus one, minus one cohomology tells you something about the obstructions to those deformations. So this is why this object, this morphism, object E dot of X together with the morphism is called deformation obstruction theory. Which is not necessarily perfect at this point, not necessarily perfect at this point. It just captures deformations and obstructions, but we didn't say whether there was obstructions to obstructions and further. If there are obstructions to obstructions, it's called non-perfect obstruction theory. If there is none, only two non-vanishing cohomologies, then it's a perfect obstruction theory. Okay, so we can see that a TIA class is a point in here, and this group naturally, via some very trivial manipulations, induces a morphism from an object E dot of X, which captures deformations and obstructions of points that the moduli space parameterizes. So this is how a TIA class is related to innovative geometry. Okay, so now let me say some facts. So deformation obstruction theories, these objects, so when we say, whenever we say deformation obstruction theory, we really mean a morphism from this suitable object that I constructed to the construct, you know, to the truncation of the cotangent complex of the moduli space. And of course, there is this famous result of Behrend and Fantecchi that somehow cohomologies of this object in the derived category, E dot of X, produce a certain cycle in Cha homology of the moduli space against which you can integrate cohomology classes and those give you deformation invariance. So this is the connection to the enumerative geometry. If you wanna count things, then you need to cook up this E dot of X and you need to then put it in the recipe of Behrend and Fontecchi, construct this cycle, which is called virtual fundamental class. And so the DT invariant in this case, because we are really looking at parameterizations of sheep is given as some kind of integral of a suitable cohomology class against the virtual fundamental class of the moduli space. And the virtual fundamental class of the moduli space is induced by cohomologies, a certain algebraic constructions of, you know, of Baron and Fantecchi, by cohomologies of E dot of X. I'm not gonna go through this. I just rather tell you what are the results. So deformation obstruction theories. So here is, a, here is what we know so far. So if, uh, D dimension of X is equal to three when X is three dimensional. Richard Thomas in his important paper, and in fact thesis showed that E dot of X gives a perfect deformation obstruction theory. Meaning that there are no higher cohomologies, there are no obstructions to obstructions, and this morphism in the draft category approximates cotangent complex of the moduli space in a way that we can just work with E dot of X, construct a virtual cycle and integrate against, and then define invariance. Then, of course, there is certain conditions in here. This is in particular, this is not always true, only when only when determinants of sheaves for any sheaf a point in the moduli space, determinant of sheaf is fixed. This is, this is highly important. Okay, there is a second result. Uh, okay, so this is the first result. There is a second result by Hoybrichs and Thomas. Um, in fact, it is the, um, you know, it's in the same paper where they discuss the universal ATIA classes uh, in this 2010, I assume, paper that if the kernel, the kernel of the canonical morphism, canonical morphism, uh, X i f comma f to h i of o of x. There is a canonical morphism because you can, if you have a sheaf, you can take the determinant of the sheaf, and then that induces a map from x i of f comma f to x i of 
determinant of f, comma, determinant of f. Those are line bundles. They cancel each other out, and you will get h i of o of x. So that's the natural trace map, canonical trace map. And the kernel of this thing is really the trace-free extension, self-extensions of the sheaf. If the kernel vanishes, if this kernel vanishes for i bigger than equal to 3, then e dot of x, together with its morphism to the cotangent complex, a truncation of the cotangent complex of the moduli space, uh, provides a perfect deformation obstruction theory. Okay. Here, importantly, this is important. Here we do not need, we do not need X to be Calabi-Yau. Often, sometimes, some people think that Donaldson Thomas invariants are only definable for Calabi-Yau varieties. That's not the case. It's more general. Okay. Now, what happens if you, if D is equal to four, what about higher dimensions? What if D is equal to four? So we have this E dot of X guy together with the morphism. And this guy was a certain push forward of an arham of the universal sheaf okay, maybe twisted by a dualizing complex together with some shift, which is, was D minus one. This was what that was. And then we can actually just roughly speaking, study whether this object makes sense. I mean, if I look at the fiber-wise cohomology, shift cohomology of E dot of X, I can see that it's, it, it has the following cohomology. So this point-wise on the moduli space, it has the following cohomologies. It, of course, it has homomorphisms and the morphisms of the sheaf that the moduli space parameterizes. It has all the other self extensions of that thing. It goes up to X3 and then even X4 because we are over a fourfold. X is a fourfold. Okay, so obviously so many cohomologies and for perfectness of the obstruction theory, we didn't, we really needed two terms only. And so we don't like these non-vanishing terms. So let us make an assumption, simplifying assumption. Simplifying assumption. Let X be a Calabi L4 so that we can use shared duality. And let us assume that F, the sheaves are stable sheaves. Okay, if that's the case, then this guy is going to be parameterized by C or C star C. Okay, because these are simple objects in their own algebra. And then we can use ser duality to say that this HOM and X4 are the same. So that one is also equal to C. So, you know, we can truncate this object. If I truncate cohomologically this object on the ends, nothing bad happens because these higher cohomologies are really constant. So maybe we can think of them as, you know, we can get rid of them. But again, you can see that over dimension four, there's a problem because we are still left with three cohomologies and definitely we cannot say anything about these things. We just know that X1 and X3 are dual to each other and this thing is self-dual. Whereas if this was a threefold, we didn't have X4, X3 and HOM would have been neglected because they could be C and we would be left with X1 and X2 and that, was, that would be perfect. But here in fourfold geometries, the object that is supposed to you know, give you the virtual cycle, at least you know, given the current technology of how to produce a virtual cycle has more than two non-vanishing cohomologies. Okay, so what is the remedy to this, really? I think in some sense, historically speaking, the remedy was also somehow 
hinted or discovered by Thomas and Donaldson. So Donaldson and Thomas, I'm sorry. So Donaldson, I mean, to my understanding really, Donaldson and Thomas wrote a paper on higher dimensional gauge theory. Higher dimensional gauge theory, which was very central. And so they were kind of suggesting some really cool idea that, you know, look at this guy, X1, X2, and X3, and assume that this guy is written as a sum of half. To, so these are, comp, you know, vector space, at least point wise, we are, you know, talking very roughly in here. These are vector spaces over complex numbers. And okay, point wise, our analysis is point wise here. So they were saying, assume that X2 is written as a sum of real half dimensional vector space, isotropic vector space together with its dual. Maybe there are some situations that the objects or the sheaves that the modulus this is parameterizing have this property that their second cohomology, second extensions can be written basically decompose into two pieces, V and V dual. And these are real spaces and half dimensional. If that's the case, then essentially we can see that somehow we get this nice symmetry in the deformation obstruction theory, even though it has three non-vanishing cohomologies. So we can see that we can see these two guys and then X1 is dual to the X3 and V is dual to V dual. So essentially, we can see that our obstruction theory is really uh, effectively given by X1 and a morphism to V, and then the dual to X3. So really effectively, it's half of the deformation obstruction theory, which is going to be useful for us. So basically, using these old machinery of Kronishi theory, you can take this, this guy, this morphism and construct a virtual cycle. So this induces in fact a virtual cycle because now it's a two term thing, Con you know, induces a virtual cycle, but then this is very local. This virtual cycle is local. And then you need to glue these local virtual cycles to each other and construct a global virtual fundamental class. And for that, you actually need your moduli space to contain some higher homotopical structures. Otherwise you can't have that. And so this is why all these constructions on the constructions of virtual fundamental class over Calabial fourfolds are kind of using so far, have been using technology of derived algebraic geometry. Okay, so what are the people who actually flourished this, this original idea of Donaldson and Thomas and kind of proved many results? I will mention their names in here. So there is Conan Lung, and his student, Heilang Sao, who worked this out for, so they constructed some virtual fundamental class, but M for them was the moduli space of vector bundles, of vector bundles on, on the Calabi L4. But this was very restricted because really under deformations, almost never a vector bundle stays a vector bundle. So this was very restricted, but then later using the Missionary of derived algebraic geometry, Joyce and company proved many results and proved the existence of this virtual cycle. So Joyce and so more, you know, people among many really uh, people that I can mention are Brav, Chris Brav and Borisov. So, um, so they constructed the virtual fundamental class for this moduli space using machinery, using derived algebraic geometry, derived algebraic geometric techniques, algebraic geometry. Okay, so now here is, I should make an announcement really. There is an amazing paper, recent paper, new result which is O and Richard Thomas. So this is 2020. All of these derived algebra geometric constructions are basically happening in some kind of analytic category. 
And as I mentioned, it does make sense after all. One of the key ingredients in, in, in such construction is that vector space V, and that's a real half dimensional vector space, half complex dimensional vector space. And so to, to construct some kind of a real class really in all of their constructions. However, Owen Richard Thomas constructed an algebraic virtual cycle. So constructed an algebraic uh, virtual cycle, which you just need to go and read their paper. They are using this localization technology developed by Edidin and Grahams, some kind of square Euler class, the square root Euler class so for some, I don't know, SOR, SORC bundles and things like that. So, I mean, it's all in their paper. That's really amazing constructions. Okay. So now I will tell you about my result. So this is joint work, which we, uh, we, we posted a while ago with Diakonescu. And yeah, and uh, the paper uh, is published in the advances. You can find it in advances. And, but we are continuing it as, as we are basically seeing there is so much rich geometry uh, for moduli space of sheaves on columnar fourfolds. There are so many things that we can say. So let me just tell you what is the relevance of a tier class in here. So let us assume for us. And, and the message of remaining part of 20 minutes of my talk is really this that, okay, so there are these fancy machineries out there, drive the algebraic geometry, real virtual cycles, and localization constructions of Owen Thomas, but sometimes you don't really need to do much. You can just construct the virtual cycles the usual way. And we are not gonna use any of those analytic categories or drive the algebraic geometric techniques here. So let us assume that Y is a smooth, projective, variety. And I'm going to assume that X is the total space of the canonical bundle of Y. I'm gonna ca call the projection map from the canonical bundle onto Y, Q. And I'm assuming that Y is sitting inside X as the zero section embedding. And let's just assume that dimension of X over complex numbers is equal to D. Again, I'm not, for now, I'm not specifying any dimension, but later, for example, dimension of X is going to be a four, dimension of Y is going to be three. So X is a non-compact fourfold which, uh, with a threefold sitting inside it. Okay, so let us assume that M is the moduli space it's a definition, moduli space of compactly coherent, compactly supported coherent sheaves on X. Uh, so this, this means compactly supported with proper support on Y. So, okay, I have a moduli space of torsion sheaves on X which, which are supported on Y. And here's an assumption. Assume that F is a scheme theoretically, scheme theoretically supported on Y. So for instance, um, let us assume that F, the sheaves are structure sheaves of curves on Y and Y has a negative normal bundle inside X then your curves cannot deform essentially into X. And so the structure sheaves of those things will be scheme theoretically supported on Y. Okay. So in fact, uh, if the scheme theoretic, scheme theoretic support on Y implies that for any sheaf that the moduli space parameterizes, we are going to fix the churn character also for them. I'm, I'm gonna call the gamma the churn character of these sheaves. Then via the zero section embedding of Y, such sheaf can always be written as a push forward of some sheaf G, 
where G is a coherent sheaf on Y. There's nothing else really such that, you know, uh, F is basically just G's and the churn character of these G's is equal to gamma after realizing them if they're pushed forward into the ambient variety X. Okay, so the point is that we have a moduli space of compactly supported sheaves on X and we called it M. And if the support of sheaves is a scheme theoretic over Y, this moduli space can also be realized as a moduli space of OY modules really. So the moduli space of sheaves on X and the moduli space of sheaves on Y will be no different really based on this assumption. So the moduli space of F and G are no different. From each other. Either you can think of these as a Y modules or you can think of them as a X modules. However, there is something funny that happens in here. You can see that if I think of these Fs as, put, as Gs really over Y, I can construct for them a certain deformation obstruction theory. And if I think of them as just Fs, co-dimension one sheaves on X, I can construct for them a deformation obstruction series. And these two deformation obstruction theories are not equal to each other. Even though the moduli spaces are equal, the two obstruction theories are not equal to each other. So this is one of those examples that you have a moduli space and you can put for it two different obstruction theories. And you would be interested then to know what is the invariance, how the invariants are related to each other. So, however, we can put two different obstruction theories by realizing sheaves as OX modules or as OY modules. Okay, so let us see what that is. Let me draw some kind of a diagram. So you have X times M. We have the universal sheaf in here. We have the projections onto X and M. This is that. And let's call this thing pi, the projection map. I called it pi onto the moduli space. And then I have a Y sitting inside X and I have Y times M in here. And this thing is also sitting inside X times M. And then I can project down onto Y and these two things are equal to each other. And then I call this projection map pi prime. Okay. So now associated to this diagram. So, okay, so the universal sheet is G in here. This is, I can call this thing I tilde. F tilde universal object on the moduli space is I tilde lower star of G tilde. You can have universal sheaves being related to each other by I tilde. So then you see the moduli spaces are just the same. So I'm gonna now use the diagram on, on the roof on top and the roof on the bottom to construct the deformation obstruction theory. On one hand, I can write R pi lower star, R hump, F tilde, F tilde, tensor with omega dualizing sheet, relative dualizing sheet, D minus one, D is the you know dimension of X to L dot of M. On one hand, I can write this thing. And on the other hand, I can write um, R pi prime R hum G tilde G tilde omega pi D minus two dimension of Y is one less than the dimension of X. So if you just follow your nose, the same construction, you will get a different thing, but the marginalized space is the same. So you got these two things. And let us call this thing E dot of X. Let us call this thing E dot of Y. 
So you have the same moduli space, but now you have produced for it two, literally two different obstruction theories, deformation obstruction complexes, two different objects, e dot of x and e dot of y, together with morphisms, which basically will give you two different obstruction theories. Why different? Why? Phi x is not equal to phi y. Maybe it is. Is it, is it the same or is it not the same? So let us see. So we can do a pointwise analysis. So, so let me ask this pointwise analysis. Let us see, you know, E dot of X captures deformations and obstructions to deformations of sheaf F. And E dot of Y captures deformations and obstructions of sheaf G. So to see how phi of X and phi of Y are different, I can just ask my questions. Is deformation of F different than deformation of G? You would think that they are the same thing because their moduli this is the same, but let us see it. So as I said, Point-wise, every such sheaf, F, is the push forward of something G coming from Y. Y is the zero section of this canonical bundle, this line bundle. Okay, so if I push forward such sheaf, such G, then I can pull it back. And naturally, I will get, I will see myself in an exact triangle. Uh, in, you know, of o, o Y modules. I will see G again, but then here I will see G tensor with co-normal sheaves of Y inside X shifted by a one. This exact triangle in the derived category was actually shown to be, to hold by Bondal and Arloff. Okay. And in fact, if y is the zero section of a bundle, which is the case in here for us, x is a non-compact d-dimensional variety given by total space of canonical bundle of y, then this short exact sequence, I'm going to call it a, then this a exact triangle is splits, in fact, in the direct category. Okay, but there is something even cooler that we can see in here. So we can apply, I'm going to apply R hom blank G to this thing because I'm interested in studying deformations, right? So I can apply R hom blank G to this exact triangle. I know that it is split, but nevertheless, it helps me to just apply it to this exact triangle as it is. So I will get this, this kind of thing, R hom G G. Then R hum pull back a push forward of G comma G. Then R hum G, I can, you know, normal bundle of Y inside X is a line bundle. So it's invertible sheaf. I can move it to the other side. So G times normal bundle of Y in X. The shift I can also take care of. It becomes negative when it goes to the control covariant variable or contravariant variable, the other variable. Okay. And then I can use the left adjoinness of the pullback and push forward to see that immediately this is nothing but R hum, I lower star of G, I lower star of G. But I lower star of G by definition is F, by the very definition. So there you go, I get F. Okay, so this is nice. I have now produced an exact triangle, even though it's a split, that in the middle sits the object in the rough category that captures deformations of F, and on the left sits an object in the rough category that captures deformations of G, but then there is this discrepancy term. And that's also understandable. The discrepancy term in here sees the normal bundle of Y and X. So basically it is telling me those pieces in the deformation theory of F, which are induced by infinitesimal movement of Y inside X. So let us call this thing, um, okay, so this, okay, I'm not gonna call it anything. So let us stare at this blue exact triangle. Now, if I apply these higher direct image sheaves, if I did this ev everything in the families, 
um, I would just, re you know, replace these by the universal sheaves and then push forward, blah, 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 twisting by the dualizing complex. I will basically get a uh, splitting the following way. So on this side, I will get, this is nothing but E dot in the middle. This is nothing but E dot of Y in, uh, on the left. And this is the discrepancy term D dot, which actually sees the deformations of Y inside X. So let us actually do that. So we will get that immediately E dot of X becomes in the derived category E dot of Y plus the discrepancy complex. One of them captures deformations of F. F is deformations of F are here, deformations of G are here. And the, the other term basically tells us how Y deforms inside X. Okay, so these are the complexes now. So what can I say relation between phi of X and phi of Y? After all, this is the cotangent complex of the moduli space. And this is what phi of X is. And this is the other obstruction theory for the same moduli space that we just produced, phi of Y. And the question is, okay, how does this thing see it? Of course, naturally, actually, this thing also gets mapped to here. And you need to investigate, basically, what happens then to the virtual cycle. Okay, so here is a theorem that we proved. Theorem, Diakonescu, uh, myself and Yao in 2018, consider a universal ATIA classes, universal ATIA classes, um, a T a class of F tilde, which is an element of mm, R hum F tilde, F tilde, again, usual thing, cotangent complex of the moduli space with a shift in by one. And then consider your universal a T a class of the sheaf, universal sheaf G tilde is also an element of this group but this, this time I'm pulling back via the pi prime, L dot of the same moduli space by one. And what we proved is that even though this is splitting happens to exist and you cannot get rid of the discrepancy term D dot, when you, when you look at the, the, what the, this map, basically a tier class is a point, is a point in here. This is a group that parameterizes, first group parameterizes this morphism, second group parameterizes the morphism phi y. And then you can ask yourself, how does the ATIA class, it's just the point of these two things and how do the ATIA classes see each other? Then with respect to, then with respect to splitting, which I call the star, there exists, there exists a decomposition, which is as follows. Atia class, universal Atia class of F is equal in fact to universal Atia class of G comma zero. So basically when you take the Atia class of F, feed it into the splitting, the image of that point will become zero in the second term, in the second group, parameterized by discrepancy term D dot of Y inside X. So even though the draft category absolutely has no idea of how to get rid of this guy, this guy is always there, you can actually trace where the ATIA classes go and you can see that you know, ATIA class given for X is equal in fact to the ATIA class given for Y. So this is immediately corollary of this thing is that the virtual fundamental class of the moduli space with the obstruction theory phi of X is literally equal to virtual fundamental, fund, fundamental class of the moduli space with the obstruction theory given by phi of Y. So this is actually immediately telling you that in this particular case, 
Calabial fourfold geometry is the same as Calabial threefold geometry, enumeratively. So you don't need to study any derived algebraic geometry or any such things. You can just study threefold theorems. So Richard, can I borrow some time or not to tell you one example of this? Yeah, I think that would be fine. Okay, so maybe five minutes if that's okay. 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 All right. So this is this is essentially the result. And so there are, we are basically saying there are under some there are some conditions where fourfold geometry is irrelevant because you can just capture invariance for over the threefold that sits inside the fourfold. And this was in fact in many calculations of Malik and Sao and Yokinobu Toda in some of their papers, it was being conjectured. So that's why we actually try to prove this statement. Okay. So here is an application. Oops, so I ran out of the whiteboard so I can now delete my first whiteboard. How should I do it? Okay. So here's an application. We can look at surface theory. So let S be a smooth projective surface such that its canonical bundle is NEF. Let D inside S be an effective divisor. Okay, so let's, uh, let us assume that we have such a situation. Then I can construct a fourfold and a threefold out of this data. So I can ask X to be a total space of canonical bundle of S twisted by D plus the structure sheaf of S twisted by minus D the morphism onto S. This is a non-compact fourfold and it's Calabi-Yau because K of S D tensor O minus D is K of S. So this is non-compact, but it's Calabi-Yau. And then there is Y that sits inside here. I can take one of the bundles, a non-compact threefold sitting inside the non-compact fourfold by a different projection map onto X. So we can ask, we can fix some churn character, fix choice of a churn character. Uh, let us do that. I'm going to fix gamma to be zero, two times class of the surface, beta and n. This is in cohomology theory of the threefold rather. So in cohomology theory of y, so realization of gamma in cohomology theory of X is going to be zero, zero. It's a co-dimension two sheaf, something like that. And so then we actually, for here, we, we can, we, you know, we can produce, with this example, we can produce the virtual cycles and we can immediately see that you don't need to work hard using conjectures and drive the algebraic geometry and whatnot. Oops, sorry. So, uh -huh. So I, suddenly I lost my pen. So you can actually see that DT theory of X for such sheaves is the same as DT theory of Y. So, so we have a threefold sitting inside the fourfold and the threefold itself is living over some surface. And so in fact, in the work with uh, Golampur and Yao, when S is equal to a K3 surface in, in joint work, joint work with Golampur and Yao, we showed some interesting facts about these DT invariants of Y. So we showed that. Um, So we showed that DT invariant of, okay, so DT invariant of X, which is four dimensional, is equal to DT invariant of Y, which is a non compact three dimensional manifold over a complex algebraic surface. And in fact, we showed that this is equal to something called Waffa Witten invariant of Y. So this is Waffa Witten invariant of Y. So these are count of solutions 
or minimizers to a certain action integral over the moduli space that Waffa Witten were studying, certain gauge theory on the surface. So Waffa Witten invariants are counting, roughly speaking, solutions to certain differential equations known as Waffa Witten equations. And the mathematical definition of Waffa Witten invariants is, in fact, given by uh, Tanaka and Thomas. So this is due to Tanaka and Thomas. So, okay, so in this situation, invariants of fourfolds are related to Tanaka Thomas or Waffle Witten invariants. And not only that, we also showed that Waffle Witten invariants of Y are in fact related to Cyberg Witten invariants of S. So, this is Cyberg Witten invariants. So, some sum of Cyberg Witten invariants of X, but twisted with some combinatorial coefficients combinatorial coefficients together with correction terms. And these correction terms are things that we also discussed. So these are invariants of nested Hilbert schemes. On S. So this is also joint work with Golampur myself and Yao, these nested Hilbert schemes are configurations of points and one-dimensional subschemes together with zero-dimensional subschemes, uh, but a, a flag of such things, nesting of such things inside S. So the, the important aspect of this analysis was that waffle witten invariants conjecturally, are, they have partition functions which are given by modular forms. And so this was actually telling us, in some cases, these guys, these correction terms also have been modular. And so this actually told us that that partition, partition function, which doesn't just see cyber with an invariance, but the twist of those things by certain combinatorial coefficients can sometimes be modular. So it allows you to compute many, many cyber with an invariance, taking advantage of difference of these two modular forms. Okay, so that is that, but then important part of this message of my talk is that sometimes things become nice because you have a fourfold whose invariance also can be related to cyber with an invariance of the surface that sits inside that fourfold. And this was also conjectured by Davish Malik and Sao and Toda, and so we gave a proof to that. Okay, so one other last connection, there is some interesting thing which you can relate cyber Witten theory of the algebraic surface to by rational geometry of that surface. Um, so you can capture certain connection between DT theory of fourfolds and by rational geometric aspects like rationality statements and things like that. Um, but unfortunately I don't have time. So I stop in here. Thank you for listening and thanks for your time. Okay, I think. Uh, are there any questions? Okay. Hey, do you see me or do I not see? I don't see me. Uh, I see you. <laughs> okay, yeah, now I see, see you. Yeah. Okay, okay. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Patrick. Questions? Yeah. Hey. Okay, then, uh, Patrick, do you have a question or? Uh... No, I, I don't. I know. think he was yeah. just saying hi. <laughs> oh, he wants to say <laughs> hi. Okay. No, I just. Oh, yeah, I, I did because I I like the clap for some reason. Yeah, I like yeah, the, yeah. the clapping. Yeah. Kind of awesome. Social clapping. That, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I I'd have to really think. Okay, up. let's thank uh, Arthur again then. Thank you for. Thank you thought. for having me.